Okay. Well, welcome everyone today to this webinar. Um, we are joining you from all across the U.S. Um, so I want to thank you all for, for chiming in um, for this particular event. Uh, I am Akila carter Francic. Um, coming to you from the Institute for the Study of Sports, Society, and Social Change. This is our first digital platform meeting and program conversation that we're having, Sport Conversations for Social Change. Um, today's conversation is also the first in a series of conversations to discuss the state of sport in this time of COVID-19. We'll be hosting conversations over the next few weeks to discuss athletes and the groups and organizations um, that support them. So again, um, some of you know me, some of you may not, uh, but Akila carter Francique. I'm the Executive Director for the Institute for the Study of Sports, Society, and Social Change out here in sunny California, San Jose, <laughs> San Jose State University. Uh, the Institute was first created in 2017 with the goal to honor the San Jose State legacy um, and to continue dialogue about athlete activism, the influence of sport and the effect of positive social change. Um, and also we know that as a nation that uh, confronts and explores these deep and complex issues to include COVID-19 and all that's going on with that, um, it's critical that we continue to challenge the boundaries of sport and activism. Sport, as we know, offers the occasion to pose big questions not just to athletes, but also to ourselves and to provide enlightened perspectives. Um, the mission of our institute is, um, it's the first and foremost is dedicated to research, to analysis, to education at the intersection of sport and, so sport and society. Um, so to learn more about this, I um, welcome you uh, to go to sjsuwordstoaction.com and become a part of the change. So over the next hour, we're gonna discuss college sport, gender, and mental health, and coping in the age of COVID-19. Um, as we know, COVID you know, first appeared in December, got into our shores in January 12th um, from China, hit the US, and there's been a lot of, um, unfortunately, uh, untimely deaths that have resulted with it. The effect in and on the U.S. and the world have been devastating with the number of lives lost. I have two lost family members um, to that. Uh, doctors, doctors and experts state that COVID-19 knows no age. It knows no race, no gender. Deaths are daily. People are losing friends, again, and family. Our government and health departments have um, mandated shelter in place. They've mandated stay at home. <laughs> such as social interactions in many cases have ceased and are limited to six foot radius, telephones, and what we're doing today, video conferencing. And many of our organizations and institutions have had to postpone events like graduation, um, programs, town halls, um, other important events for student engagement, um, as well as games um, of that matter. Um, and even more detrimental, um, some have canceled and even closed doors as we look at businesses across. Um, I just, for FYI, flew back into California yesterday to an empty airport. <laughs> um, so it was a little, little haunting to say the least. But with that said, for SJSU and many institutions of higher education, students, faculty, and staff have been sent home. Face-to-face -face learning was transitioned to online format. Daily communication is through email and or through conference communication platforms like this. And in sport at all levels to include college sport and for many athletes, this pandemic has disrupted their daily routines. And I think the key word here is daily. Um, I think I would be okay to say that college athletes live and breathe by the clock, their class schedule, and their daily routine. Similar to non-athletes, college athletes were always also sent home. Classes were also trans transitioned online, but their training, preparation for competition, and competition seasons, specifically winter and spring sport athletes, was disrupted. Um, to address this disruption, the NCAA has released a statement um, on Monday, uh, March 30th, to extend the sport, um, spring sport athletes' eligibility for an additional year, stating that Division I Council on uh, says Monday voted to allow schools to provide spring sport student athletes an additional season of competition and an extension of their period of eligibility. 
Division I rules limit student athletes to four seasons of competition in a five-year period. The council's decision allows schools to self-apply waivers to restore one of the seasons of competition for student athletes who had competed while eligible in this time of COVID-19 that, that shortened their spring 2020 season. Now, I believe this is great in many respects because it eases the stress, the anxiety, and mental duress of student athletes. But on the business end, there are financial implications to this extension. Um, the article further highlights that the council's decision gives individual schools the flexibility to make decisions at a campus level. Um, the Board of Governors ev has even encouraged conferences and schools to take action in the best interest of their student athletes and their communities. And now schools have the opportunity to do that. Um, one note I think is important to say is that winter sports were not included in this decision. Mm. So <laughs> with all of that said, there's a lot going on. Um, there's a lot of conversations that are happening and we're here today to sort of add to that. Conversations have been taking place over the past few days. Um, just yesterday, the Black Women's Sports Foundation um, had a talk and dealt with some of the challenges. And what we're going to be talking about is the mental health aspect of it. Um, University of Texas, their African American Male Research Initiative, um, Black Male Student Athlete Summit hosted a session a couple of hours ago. Um, we have our session today and uh, tomorrow Arizona State University's Global Sport Institute will host a, a conversation. And um, one of my colleagues, Dr. Janice Hilliard with Hilliard Solutions will have another conversation, um, which was an extension of a platform, uh, a, a town hall she was gonna have on Monday and, or sorry, Sunday and Monday. So one thing I wanna know is who do we have in the room with us today? I'm gonna do just a quick little poll. Um, and as you're filling out that poll, I'm gonna introduce you to um, our panelists that we have in front of you. So as we go through this conversation, you'll just be able to, we'll just be able to view our panelists. Um, we'll bring in um, and unmute everyone later, um, but please feel free to chime in with questions should you have um, shortly. So let me get to that. Our first panelist, Dr. Emmett Gill, um, past president and CEO for the Alliance of so Social Workers and Sport. He's an adjunct clinical professor in the University of Texas at Austin of Social Work, North Carolina State University Department of Social Work, and even Monmouth University um, and the University of Washington. Um, at these institutions, he teaches sport and social work courses. He's also a former director for the Student Athlete Wellness and Personal Development at the University of Texas at Austin and North Carolina Central University. Dr. Gill, professor, scholar, um, focuses on athlete mental health, sports scandals, and the intersection with social work themes and the development of mental health and wellness systems for sport organizations. He's published over 25 articles in the area of sport and social work and looks to continue his scholarship in the area of black athlete mental health trauma and wellness. Next, we have Dr. Keno Miller, director of mental health and follow-up care at Tulane University. He's a counseling and sports psychologist who serves as director of mental health and follow-up care um, for the professional athlete care team at Tulane University School of Medicine. He's experienced in administering comprehensive clinical assessments, treatment planning, and providing individuals and family counseling with current and former athletes. He specializes in issues of impacting men and their families, focusing on a variety of concerns, including anxiety, depression, trauma, career life transitions, relationship issues, identity development, and athlete performance. He received his PhD in counseling um, psychology with a concentration in sports psychology from Indiana University in Bloomington. And he's a native of Dallas, Texas, uh, with over 10 years of um, experience serving athletes at every developmental level. Last and certainly not least, uh, we have Mel Day. Um, she's gonna bring a little slant to us today, which I'm excited for. She's a lecturer and in the Department of Art and Art History um, right here at San Jose State University. She's a filmmaker, co-founder of the Wall of Song Project. Um, she's an interdisciplinary artist, um, filmmaker, educator, um, and was previously at UC Berkeley. She's a recipient of the 2019 Silicon Valley Create Art, Creates Artist Laureate Nexus Award, that's a mouthful, <laughs> for her pioneering work in art and technology. 
Her work explores the role of uncertainty of collective singing and collective singing at the intersection of sports and civic engagement. Her video installations, civic singing interventions, and participatory sports stadia performances have been shared nationally and internationally at venues uh, to include a wealth of places, San Francisco, Berlin, Germany, um, and even right here in San Jose. And she'll talk more about that today. Um, as part of her inclusive practice, she founded the IDEO Award Youth Fellowship with, uh, and you're going to have to help me with this name. Jurassic. <laughs> Jurassic Resident Artist Program and co-founded the Wall of Song Project, which she's going to share with us today. She holds an MFA from UC Berkeley, a BFA from Queen's University in Canada. Hey, okay. And uh, with the Year Scholarship Exchange in Glasgow School of Arts in Scotland. So my first question to each and every one of you, well, first of all, welcome. Um, just welcome so much to taking time out of your day to be with us. Um, but my first question to each and every one of you is, you know, what, what does sport mean to you? Um, and what role does it play in your life? <laughs> Go ahead, Doc Miller. Uh, <laughs> uh, I would argue that for me, sport is a means of emancipation, um, freedom of movement, freedom of thought expression. Um, my dissertation looked at um, um, challenging the emasculation of Black identity through sport and the role of um, being able to confirm one's place and space in this world. Um, I'm a former Division I athlete. I walk on, I fought my butt off to make it on the field, but I learned something about myself that because I was uh, challenged in, in so many ways, um, I learned how to overcome things psychologically. And so when I met other challenges in life, um, trying to get a PhD, I used some of the same tools um, that were familiar to me from my time as a walk-on student athlete. Um, nothing was given and everything had to be, um, you know, you have to double down on some things when you don't have some of the talents, uh, some of the gifts. But for me, in terms of my role as a psychologist now working with athletes, current athletes, former athletes, um, it is how do you challenge yourself to be your very best for seven minutes, two seconds, you know, however long it takes to perform. Um, you know, I have worked with riflers um, at the collegiate level. I've worked with Division I uh, national champion and now I, I think I could say world champion um, track and field athletes. Um, I've worked with national championship and Super Bowl championship caliber athletes. It's all the same. How do they challenge themselves not only in that moment, but also moving beyond? So sport for me is transformative. Great. Thank you. Now or Emmett? Yes. I guess I would add to that. Go, go, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> I would just add to that to say that for me, uh, sport is not only transformative, it's a, I think it's part wrapped up in that is courage. Um, as a uh, former college athlete and as a goalie in water polo at uh, Queen's University in Canada, uh, it just really uh, was an exercise in courage and resilience to um, to be in the goal, to be in the net, um, and face those shots. But um, as an artist, I'm really interested in particularly in women in sport and how we can support women's athletics through uh, collective singing rituals and fan experiences that really um, strengthen the support for, for women and female identified athletes in general. So I think that those intersections are what are really um, interesting for me to speak further with you today. And, it's a, and I wanted to thank you, Akila, also for organizing this important conversation right now. Thank you. Dr. Gill. Yeah, I think for me, um, Akila, you know, sport is, is really about um, opportunity. Um, you know, like my colleagues here today, like all of us, you know, we're former Division One student athletes. And, you know, for me, had I not been able to play baseball, I wouldn't have gone to school and I wouldn't have stayed in school. And so I believe in the power of sport to make, to motivate people to do phenomenal things. Um, I think the other thing that sport means to me is community. 
Um, whether you're on a team and you put on that jersey, you're on the same team. Mm. Whether you're a fan and you put on that jersey, you're on the same team. It doesn't make any difference whether you're a Republican or Democrat. It doesn't make any difference whether you're white, Hispanic, Asian, or black, Catholic, Baptist, you know, Protestant. It doesn't make any difference, you know, for those hours, um, you know, that you're engaged in that sport. It's all about community. Um, so, so those are the two things um, that are most important um, to me. But I'm so excited to be on this because, see, I remember Doc Miller when he was just coming up. And he, was, he was he was doing his thing and he was like, man, I'm going to these are all the things that I want to do. So I'm so happy to to join this with him. And then Akilah, you know, I, I think the memory that I have of you and I when we were we were in Nashville at, at, um, at a conference. And I think it was prior to you doing your dissertation and, and, and now to see you doing the things that you're doing. So so really excited to uh, I feel really old. <laughs> but um, just 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 re- when I went through that, uh, I, I may need some counseling after this, but <laughs> really, really excited for the work, work that y'all are doing. Lessons. Great. Well, you know, I think, uh, like I said, we're having a number of conversations and this is just one of many. Um, and um, Emmett has, has been so gracious in kind of hosting a number of, of conference calls through his organization. Um, to talk about, you know, the mental health aspect. The Institute's goal this year was also to really hone in on mental health um, in the context of sport. Um, And I think we're seeing it sort of rear its head, particularly for those college athletes. Um, We've had a lot of, you know, communication fans disappointed because March Madness did not happen. They bought tickets, um, you know, to games. They're not going to be able to see these athletes and players, uh, you know, professional basketball season, you know, has ended. So there's, there's just a lot of challenges that we're seeing from fans and from those that really value the role that sport has played in their life from a fandom standpoint. But I want to know from you all, you know, what does this mean for that actual athlete? You know, we've seen the, the, the professional athletes. I think they, can, they are coping with it. Again, it is a disruption, um, but they're coping with it because they have some of the financial means to cope with it. But what does it mean for the student athlete, um, again, whose routine has been disrupted, whose season has been canceled? um, And for many, it may have been, quote, technically their last season. What does all that mean um, to you? What are you seeing? um, What challenges are you learning from the athletes that you are working with? Dr. Miller? I can definitely speak. Uh, uh, so I work with a combination, just to explain, I work with a combination of um, retired uh, athletes as well as um, current student athletes. And from the student athlete perspective, there is some uh, challenges in terms of, I'll give just brief examples. Um, it's a challenge to go back home when your university was a safe space for you. It's a challenge to go back home when um, you're, if you're already locked inside, I mean, you may be food, food insecure. Um, at least when you're on the campus, there's a training table and you know where the next meal is going to come from. Um, so some of the student athletes I've been worked with and I've talked with, um, those are real um, challenges at home. Um, uh, there are challenges in terms of freedom freedom of expression. And so we're going to talk a little bit later about some therapy, but freedom of expression helps the uh, athlete to grow, um, particularly with young athletes and athletes in that transitional period in life. So um, the ones I interact with, um, there are some challenges in terms of uncertainty. Yes, you're, you're back in classroom, you're taking everything online, but to go back home and be in some spaces that you probably don't feel um, whole or validated, that's a real challenge. And I think the last part for me, the people I've been engaged with, um, camaraderie. Um, I spoke with a student athlete, they had a Zoom engagement that was quote unquote mandated, but uh, that was taken away from them today. And so now the athletes are challenged to be able to create their own structure. Um, and so to be able to now do that, yes, they have access to the technology, but it's one more blow 
um, for them to now have to say, okay, now how do we do this? How do we create a Zoom community? How do we create these groups? And so for professionals such as myself, working with student athletes, we have to help them create the forum, but ultimately their voice um, is so important to make sure we, we find places and spaces where they can continue to excel and ex most importantly for me, express themselves. Um, so those are some of the challenges I've seen in terms of student athletes that I've encountered and worked with, and we're working on how do we support them best. Okay, and so we'll talk a little bit later about ways to support um, I think we have some, some great best practices that you could share. Dr. Gill, could you share some of the um, issues and challenges that you've heard from student athletes and what they've engaged in, particularly as your practice as a, as a social worker, what, what has sort of come to head? Same situation that um, Dr. Miller talked about or something a little different? Yeah, Gil, I mean, it, it, a lot of it's the same. I mean, um... And so I'll, I'll try and think of some some unique factors to sort of further enrich the conversation. I think one 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 big thing is is going to be substance use, um, and it's going to be you know athletes who now have sort of an abundance of time, um, athletes who may have overcome past substance use issues, um, athletes who are self medicating, um, and so I think that substance use is is an issue. Um, I think the you know, athletes are now in a closed space. You know, they're with family. You know, what does that look like? Is that mom? Is that mom and dad? Is that mom, dad, and a couple of sisters and a couple of brothers and a dog? You know, what does that look like? Yeah. Um, I think the other the other piece from a maybe a strengths based perspective, you know, although it still presents a challenge, is is, is now it's like, okay, well, what do I do? You know, um, I'm done with this online course, I'm done with my workout, and I've still got, you know, four or five hours of the day that I'm not used to having. And so, you know, I'm not sure what to do. So what's wrong with me? You know, I don't have that hobby or, or I don't have, you know, that significant other that I can engage in conversations with. And so, you know, from a strengths-based perspective, you know, they have these opportunities now to explore different identities and do different things. Um, and like I said, although it's a it's an opportunity, you know, it can still be a challenge for those student athletes. And then lastly, I'll say, you know what? I mean, it's the uncertainty that we're all dealing with. Mm -hmm. It's like, when is this going to end? Is is you know, are we going back first summer session? Are we going back second summer session? Are we going to be back in the fall? But hold up, wait a minute. This is pretty nice um, here. I don't have the same anxiety. I don't have the same stressors. So when it's time to come back, am I going back? And so, you know, uh, hopefully that that enriches the conversation because, you know, while student athletes are having challenges, not all of them are those those negative uh, things or opportunities that they need to take advantage of. OK. Um, and that's one of the things I think it's important that you both shared was, you know, the notion of college sport was a safe space. And, you know, I, I agree with that. That was my new family that I had created. And, and, you know, it's one thing if you're a freshman or a first year student, but what if you've been there three to four years and you've really developed that? Um, the notion of food insecurity, very real. Thank you for, for sharing that information as well. Um, but it is that, that space of identity development that's forming. And if you've been able to sort of express yourself in that space, what does it mean when you go back home. I was just recently at home with my parents and my children and my nephew, and we we're all on top of each other, you know, and so what does that mean? I'm trying to, we're all trying to study, you know, but what does that mean when you're trying to, you were um, expressing those, and we know we have different identities, um, those that are um, coming out and, and really um, embracing the fact that they're part of the LGBTQ community. Um, some may be, you know, taking advantage of other opportunities that they weren't necessarily allowed to um, express themselves in at, at home, you know, new hobbies, um, educational pathways, study groups, um, associations, going to conferences. So I appreciate you sharing that. Another part that I want to share, and um, we're going to get shown up here, is just the, the important reality, I think, of that substance use that you mentioned um, when we talk about sort of that mental health piece and um, and we have some organizations that definitely share that, uh, 
when we talk about the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, um, SAMHSA, um, talks about those notions of resilience and stress management. So uh, I think that's another a site that I want to put out there for everyone to, to be mindful of um, and to, to tap into yeah. um, to find some information and some resources for your respective student athletes, um, for yourself, for your campuses, um, to deal with issues of, I believe if you type in resilience and stress management, that will um, begin to come up. And so it talks about the concept of resilience and how a person, organization, community can enhance resilience, um, concepts of stress management. Um, and so understanding all of that and some of those challenges, have you um, uh, prescribed a certain or utilized a certain model to help athletes manage? Are we using, you talked about the strengths base. Are we looking at this as a, a, a loss and grieving um, type model, or is it one of, you know, sort of a retirement and transition? Is there a one size fit all, or is it individually based? Is it based on sport? Is it based on team? Is it based on gender? Uh, I, I think, you know, loss and grief, you know, strength based models, sport retirement, I think they all come in play. Um, exactly as you, you've alluded to, Akilah, I think it's, it's a situation where, you know, you really have to this is where academic counselors and mental health, behavioral health professionals really need to, to, uh, to be at their best in terms of practicing their craft. Um, you know, because we don't have a lot of time, we're doing things virtually, and there are a myriad of needs amongst our student athletes, you know, across the type of sport, across year in school, um, across race and gender. And so it, it, it does, it, it has to be sort of, um, you have to have your best assessment skills um, prepared to do this. For me, with, with some of the kids that I've spoken with, it's definitely strengths based. You know, we're gonna come out of this and are you gonna come out of this in a better place? Okay. Um, for a select few, um, it, it is more loss and grief, but I'd also throw another in, you know, some of these kids are dealing with trauma. I mean, just like Kino mentioned, you know, you're going, school was your safe space and now I gotta go back to a place that, you know, may have not been the best situation or, you know, something happened that you leave on the, t that's been left on the table that now I have to deal with. Um, so there are a lot of different models, uh, you know, that we could sort of work from, um, but assessment is key. Okay, thank you. I wanna uh, take a moment and sort of switch gears a little bit. Um, oftentimes when we talk about sport, um, and because I do the work that I do, <laughs> sport is oftentimes viewed as a, a, male, a male space. Um, and so with that, many of the models um, and things that we begin to talk about are from that perspective. Um, but I wonder what is going on as it relates to women in sport. Um, this past February, we celebrated um, National Girls and Women in Sports Day. Uh, we've, you know, obviously had 48 years of Title IX. Um, I'm wondering for those female athletes that you work with, and this is, um, again, something that I'm very curious about, what has been some of those, those challenges? Um, one of the things I kind of think about is, you know, with National Girls and Women in Sports Day, it's one where we definitely promote, celebrate women's engagement in sport. Um, actually, this past uh, February, uh, Mel graciously <laughs> asked the Institute to participate in something like that. And I said, hey, you know, this is right up my, my alley with what we do. Um, mm -hmm. Again, it, it's an opportunity to focus on women because it, sometimes they, they get left out. Um, and through that, we utilized her wall of song project. And Mel's going to talk a little bit about that. But tell us a little bit, Mel, about, um, you know, what celebrating women in sport meant, um, what it meant through this project, how you got people involved. Um, and then uh, we'll hit it the, a little bit of, you know, what that meant for you as it relates to, to music um, as we switch gears. Yeah. 
Sure, happy to do that. Do you want me to share my screen? Because I can yeah, show a few feel slides. Feel free to do that. That's all right. Okay, whoops. Um, yeah, this was a great opportunity. Uh, February 24th, it was. We were at the women's basketball game um, and celebrating the, the National Girls and Women in Sports Day. Um, and so it's something that I've been doing annually for the past few years, celebrating that. And so this was a great opportunity to share. So tell us a little bit more yeah. about that. Sure. Thanks, Akila. So um, might seem a little tangential to some of you, but I am an artist, as was mentioned, and I've always been fascinated by song. And I think in these times, it's interesting. I think many of us have probably seen a few of these singing projects that have been happening with music, or even just learning about how the Italians were singing from their windows as a way to come together in isolation. And I've always been interested in the different kind of fluency in song to sort of help us touch each other at a distance which seems particularly relevant right now. Um, a song can really be a way to uh, lift our spirits and morale, but it also has been known to do these, all these other host of effects, um, like uh, not only increase our well-being, but it can actually be shown to joint, cultivate joint perspectives, cooperation, even a less egocentric mindset. So these things have been called the choir effect. So what I'm really interested in doing is drawing upon the choir effect, as it were, to support women's athletics by creating collective singing rituals that we can um, use to uh, uh, work on our sense of community and uh, work to in, uh, cultivate kind of an inclusive democratic uh, chorus, if you will, in women's sports. And so this brought me together with Akila. And so we did the Wallow Song Project. Uh, oh, I should just back up quickly. This is a project I did with hundreds of, with my first Wallow Song Project, with hundreds at Grace Cathedral in San Francisco, um, basically singing Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah in two parts, one online, and then this combining those voices together, and we sang along in a live performance, which is similar to what we're doing in Wallow Song Project. So here, what we're asking people to do is to, um, add their voices or inviting them to add their voices and sing Nina Simone's Feeling Good online. And then we are combining those voices together into this growing, evolving democratic chorus that we're sharing in a series of uh, video and live singing events. Um, this is uh, uh, actually resulted in, so this is a, an event we actually had a month ago, uh, believe it or not. Uh, it's hard to imagine being in a sports stadium now but we mm -hmm. had this as part of a women's basketball game halftime event where we played this participatory video, which you see here on the right, um, on the Jumbotron. And then uh, the fans and the, uh, sang along with the help of a hundred member choir, Spartan marching band and soloists in a live singing event. But the idea is not to suggest that this is a cure all or anything like that to sing at any one time. But in our case, what we're trying to do is create something generative. So in other words, this, the singing that happens in this particular event will be folded into the participatory choir and people who add their voices will be added to that chorus and that will become inspiration for future singing at women's uh, athletic events. So that's a little bit about what we've been doing and um, why I'm you know, interested in this intersection of song and sport, like building upon these choir effects to embolden us to, to, to be in community with one another. So I kind of had a little highlight reel, actually. I could share if we have a moment, uh, Keila. It's one minute yeah. long. Go so. ahead and show the highlight reel, and then we'll... Um, then I can they pass can it back. Yeah. So let's just get this. Can you hear that? See it okay? We can see it. All right. Hopefully you can hear it. I'm going to turn it up a little bit. You can turn that up. That would be great. Okay, it's Max. <laughs> Can you hear it? Should I turn it? Should I just relapse this? Can you hear it okay? Let's try again. I can stop sharing and you can play it if you want from your own platform. Okay. Um, that we'll, get that, we'll get that pulled up. Um, Beth will have Beth switch that over yeah, for I'll us. stop sharing then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But I think it's important. I really appreciate, um, you know, that. Um, I ended up on another call. Yes. Sorry, sorry, sorry. 
Um, so I guess we can go ahead and get started. Okay. Beth is going to show that for us. As an artist, I thought a lot about the ways we might use our voices to embolden us, to feel good, and to work towards positive social change. It's a great opportunity to say, let's come together and put our own voice in creating social change. It's a new dawn, it's a new day. And the whole goal is to celebrate sport as a platform to continue to be empowered through sport participation. Oh, that was amazing. Thank you so much to our incredible SJSU choirs, to our soloists, the Spartan Marching Band, and especially to you all for joining us tonight. That was amazing. Um, <laughs> uh, I think we, you know, we got a lot of people that um, that enjoyed that event. Uh, I saw my little ones chimed in, but the audience participation, and so from that we really saw sort of a power of music. And so I'm wondering, um, with I think it might have some reverb. <laughs> I'm wondering with I'm that, wondering what do uh, you all feel, our, our practitioners feel about music as serving as a form of therapy in this time? Um, and I say that because uh, a couple years ago during my time as the um, incoming president for NAS, the North American Society for the Sociology of Sport, I put together a themed conference of sport, music, and culture. Um, initially, I will say, I think I felt a lot of pushback because people weren't quite understanding how all of that went together. Um, but we see music in everything that we do when we talk about sport interaction, from the marketing of it to um, fan, you know, the fan and game day experience, um, to how athletes prepare. You know, they have headphones locked in as they're getting ready to prepare to go compete. Um, hence all of the, the wonderful headphone um, uh, versions that we have with, you know, um, the, the beats by Dre, etc. Um, but I will say with that conference, I was happily pleased with the number of people that bought into it and talked about, um, again, how sport um, intersects with uh, um, music and um, our cultural um, ways of being. Uh, so with that said, um, do you see music playing a role now for our athletes. I think from a societal standpoint, we're seeing a lot of that. Um, if you guys are IG people um, and into DJing, um, Questlove <laughs> has a DJ. Uh, uh, DJ D Nice is doing this hashtag club quarantine um, all night long. And so we're seeing people come around through the use of music and song, much like Mel shared with us. Um, is that something that is, can be beneficial in this, this, this time for these athletes? and for female athletes too. Yeah, I definitely believe that it, <laughs> uh, music, song, um, working with any population, but I, I, I like to chime in specifically as we think about our female athletes. Um, before I even really talk about music, uh, I think it's important to know the value of sport as we talk about, is it gendered? I mean, we see uh, research that shows higher academic achievement for female as uh, athletic performers, um, uh, high levels of self-esteem, uh, decreased um, depression rates. Um, we also show um, that participating in sport helps to invalidate and or challenge messages of inferiority, misogynistic uh, themes, patriarchal messages that are kind of pervasive in our society, if we want to admit that. Um, decrease isolation, so improve cardio, physical health, and well-being. So there are a number of studies that have looked at um, women and female-identified participants of sport and said that sport is good for the body and the mind of those who participate. When we're looking at uh, music, However, as an, as an intervention, 
I think sometimes it's one of the last things people really think about is music is healing. Uh, but I want to chime in and, and recall back to something Dr. Gill said, uh, support is community. And um, when you think about athletes who get together in the tunnel and they get together and they have a song that they kind of sing, um, the guys in the locker room um, or, or the young the women, uh, part of the NCAA excitement of it is, and they came out with a video a few years ago, the NCAA, um, talking about uh, the ritual. And they showed um, different locker rooms and how the female athletes got ready for sport and how they pumped themselves up, how they challenged themselves and how they got loose. And music is a part of that. It, it's very clear that um, we see it as a distraction at times, but we also see it as something that is extremely empowering and connecting. Um, so I always call back to, because obviously the work I, I've done is around masculinity, um, but when we think about what we've seen uh, colloquially known as the haka dance, um, you're watching music rhythmic chants in a way that brings together the team. In the same way, music has that capacity to not only manage anxiety, um, stress, um, isolation, but it can also build um, especially in a time like this where we're social distancing, it can continue to build community. Um, and so I want to look to this slide right here in terms of just the data. Um, music obviously helps us um, chemically to feel good uh, dopamine. You pick, pick, pick your favorite song and two lines into it, you probably feel a lot better than you did prior to singing it, right? And so if you just look, I won't bore you with the slide, but if you just look at this image of this brain, it kind of talks about um, many of the aspects we just kind of overlook that music can actually capture and enhance, particularly if we look at reduction of pain. So in mental health, we always think about chronic pain. Um, why? Because I work with athletes and that's the reality of the sport. Well, how do we in session talk about music and how do we introduce some type of um, treatment that uses music as a means of helping. So this is one of the things that I think has gone under-researched, but is very prevalent in our society, and it does have application in terms of mental health. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I think just, just to echo um, what Kino is saying is, I mean, look at, what, what do you call it, the TikTok? TikTok now? Everybody, yeah. TikTok, you know, and, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get my TikTok on soon. I'm gonna tell you that now. And I love to hear what y'all's favorite song is. Two, two lines in, you know, what, what does it for you? But you know, all those things. I mean, you know, the music. Now, let's keep it real. I mean, you know, a lot of our music right now is misogynistic. So, you yep. know, sort of got mixed feelings about how that goes off, and too much of that, you know, might not be good for you. But in, in general. I mean, you know, it's an incredible thing. As I was looking at the yeah. presentation that you had earlier, I'm just thinking how powerful that could be if we could get all of our students mm -hmm. and our student athletes to, to be on a call and, and all, you know, sing, sing a common song. Um, it would be a powerful thing. Mm -hmm. If you, I want to go back to the, to the female student athletes just for one, for, for yeah. one second. And I think the thing that we miss is sort of the relationships. Mm. You know, when I was embedded in athletics, you know, I could depend on a lot of our female student athletes to bring my male athletes along. Yep. They go in the study hall, you need to go. They're going to this mm -hmm. event, you need to go. I mean, mm -hmm. the reality is, is that whether you're a white, black, or Asian female student athlete, you're probably coming into college more prepared than your male counterparts. Oh, yeah. And, and they carry, you know, not just in our families at home, you know, but on campus, they, they sort of, they can carry the team sometimes. Mm -hmm. I know that, you know, I, I would assume that that's, that's something that our guys are missing. I think that's something that our athletic departments are missing. Mm -hmm. um, it's just that, that extra something that female student athletes bring to the table um, that, that helps an athletic department go in many different ways. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that, you know. Again, former student athlete at the University of Houston, so go Cougs <laughs> and track and field. But we have very strong relationships, even to this day, with my teammates. Um, they are sisters. They are aunts to my 
my, my children. Um, but we, because we were a collective team of men and women, we often work together, you know, for those creating those study hall moments while we were on the road, um, you know, creating family um, as I would cook dinner or bake cakes when, because we're away from home. So we're celebrating birthdays. Um, so I really um, believe in the power um, of female athletes and what they can do, um, not only in the field of competition, but much, much more beyond. Um, and so I, I thank you for, for each and every one of you for working with those women. Um, Emmett, you know, I'm familiar, you were, you were there during the Don Imus situation um, many moons ago and helping those young women cope through those realities. Um, I myself have worked with um, women at Texas A&M, um, having my sister to sister program with my colleague, Denise Dorch. Um, so, you know, women have a, a, a way to kind of cultivate. And my goal with, with all of that was just to bring everybody together. Um, and I've had the, the great opportunity of working with some young women here at San Jose State University, uh, particularly with the gymnastics team and women's uh, swimming and diving. So it's been a great opportunity. And I really want to make sure that we remember them in this conversation, um, because oftentimes they do sort of get left behind um, in some of those discussions and considerations. Um, continuing and kind of moving on, uh, this healing power of music, we talked about different, different ways to get people. Kino, you talked about, you know, how music begins to impact our lives and how it helps us sort of cope with some of these realities. Um, I want you to just kind of hit the last few points. I think that that you wanted to make with regards to um, what music can do, um, not only for our female athletes, but also again for our male athletes uh, and how we can sort of build morale yeah. through, through song, you know, through okay. engagement, through um, bringing them together to have some, uh, as, as Dr. Gill suggested, bringing them together for a collective voices, perhaps using a sex ed male's platform of feeling good and um, understanding the thesis behind Nina Simone, that even through all of these trials, which we're going through um, currently, how can we kind of come together and build this community? I, 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 I think it's very rich. Uh, I want to echo some of the concerns that Dr. Gill mentioned, because you're right, some of the songs out there today, woo, but... Yeah. Mel's work is significant because the catalog is so deep. You have to go deeper. When Beyonce uh, gives us a song, Who Runs the World Girls, that's empowering. Um, when you look at a uh, Super Bowl halftime performance in formation, um, that's empowering. I, I don't care how you look at it. That, that's a powerful image and you can find uh, into the breadth of music a catalog of empowering um, songs that take us out of the club and still continue to challenge us to go well beyond. But uh, yes, I mean, obviously, if you are a practitioner or if you're helping female um, student athletes get um, into therapy or utilize some of these resources, they're there. Um, and so you see the top three things that we're talking about here, music therapy, obviously used to treat symptoms. The number Number two, one and two issues I've dealt with in terms of uh, clinical cases are anxiety, depression, uh, and post-traumatic stress in terms of the top three, but anxiety and depression. Those two areas right there um, are quite significant amongst um, many of the athletes I've worked with. Um, but what I want to say is music can be a vehicle to kind of use an intervention that helps move people through this process in therapy. And so when we look at how to become more resilient, um, particularly when you have a global pandemic, these are just some of the things and suggestions that we found that can be helpful. Uh, obviously focusing on what you can control. And so that takes a little bit of work, um, being able to kind of minimize some of the things that are more pervasive in our community, um, fear, anxiety, um, challenging catastrophic thoughts. So sometimes when you're sitting there alone, be that, by yourself or at home with a family member or home in your dorm room, uncertainty breeds um, negative thoughts. And so that's one of the challenges um, that practitioners are going to help um, many of these athletes work with is managing those catastrophic thoughts. And obviously being in the present, that's one of the things what we do know is there is an uncertain time, but we do know 
most student student athletes are continue to go back to class. So there is a little bit of safety there. Um, in addition, knowing that NCAA says, okay, you're going to get the season back. And so for an athlete, I was working with this last week and this week. Last week, she lost a season. This week, she gained a season back. That helped manage some of that anxiety and help her, okay, I got this now. So, and then finding priorities, you know, um, how do you spend time, you know, and like uh, Dr. Gill was saying, a significant rise in substance use. So what does substance use mean for your, what does it mean for your performance? I get it. It's a way of self-medicating. It's familiar, but let's talk about your performance. And so it's a challenge there. And then um, for me, in terms of resilience, um, self-care, um, it's okay to understand that, you know, it, it really sucks being uncertain and being in this position, but you're okay. We want to normalize the uncertainty, but also allow the student athletes to just make sure they're taking care of themselves, making sure they're getting the food. I, I know that could be difficult, but want to make sure they're managing their sleep, managing um, their diet, exercise, and managing the social relationship. It's good to go online and participate in these Instagram parties, house parties, or whatever the case may be. Maintaining some level of normalcy, be it virtually, is a way to continue to promote resilience. All right. So with that said, um, all good, all good information. I wanted to, um, you know, take the time to open up to those that are listening um, to ask questions of our panelists. Uh, and I want to actually, I want to be the first one <laughs> to kind of ask a question and really thinking about the takeaways from this today. Um, so as a, you know, you all in the audience are putting questions together and submitting them in, um, one of the things that I want to try to understand from you uh, is what are the first steps? Uh, was talking with, with Dr. Gill and some other um, colleagues last week, you know, what is, what is step one in sort of creating that normalcy? Is it making a schedule? Um, and then beginning to fill some things in is, what does that look like? Is it, you know, developing your meal plan? Is it developing, you know, some sort of um, mantra to just kind of keep yourself focused and centered? So what can athletes do to help themselves? Um, what can parents and family do to support? And what can coaches and administration do to guide and support? So any one of you jump in with any sort of response that we can think about um, some takeaways? I mean, my, I, I think I, I think I'd go sort of uh, maybe in the opposite direction for a second. Okay. Um, and, and when thinking about student athletes, you know, outside of your coursework, I take a little bit of time off. Okay. You know, I might relax for a little bit, you know, sleep late, you know, um, do those internet you know, parties, uh, you know, virtually and spend some time with some friends, make some phone calls, talk to some people, repair some relationships. You know, those are some things I might think about doing. And then the next thing I would think about doing is really being transparent with yourself, you know, and sitting down for a couple of days or a day or two and just doing an assessment. Where am I? You know, where am I spiritually? Where am I socially? Where am I psychologically? Where am I physically? Where am I in terms of my educational goals? I mean, keep it, I mean, be real. You know, be as real as you possibly can. Um, you know, maybe pull in some, some, some thoughts from some trusted, the people in your trusted circle. You know, maybe reconfigure your circle. Um, so I go back to, first of all, rest for a minute. Just slow down. I mean, you've dedicated your whole life, you know, to athletics. You know, the world, as we've seen, you know, the world will slow down. You know, so slow down for a minute. And then, you know, a thoughtful assessment about where you are. And then a, a game plan, like you were saying, Akila, about where you want to go. Thank you. I really resonate with what you just said there, Emmett. I, I couldn't agree more. This is being an opportunity for, I'm not going to speak specifically to athletes, but just more in general, this collective pause, kind of being a moment to slow down and focus on um, the aligning your life and thinking about the interior, inner life in a sense of how you can support your athletics in the future by setting up. Um, your, your mental health, your space, your system, so that you can use this time to, to just, and in a way you couldn't focus normally on those issues that are 
that help you promote success when, you know, hopefully we can come back to our normal rushing around on our regular schedules, athletic schedules. But I just wanted to really um, say, I think that's an excellent point there and important to consider. I actually want to make sure I, I acknowledge that as well. Um, what I've told uh, student athletes and what I've tried to preach to administrators, it's not business as usual. Um, resting your mind and having a moment to take inventory of how you got here, you know, is a therapeutic approach being mindful in terms of mindfulness. What do you do first? I think wake up in the morning with a mantra, have some level of, um, level of inspiration. I always talk to student athletes about um, positive affirmations. So we wake up with a positive affirmation. If you find that song that really helps you rejuvenate and feels like you're popping, play that song first thing every morning. That's what gets you going. It's like a drill sergeant, but it's a song. Mm -hmm. But for me, I mean, I would argue with athletic administrator, it's not business as usual. Um, this is a traumatic time. It's, it's, it's a scary time. And we have to acknowledge that, that when we inflict any type of trauma uh, or any disruption of your routine, it's going to take a little bit to get back into that. And so everyone's going to manage this situation um, individually. But for me, in working with those student athletes, yes, rest, but also find a moment to re really focus on your health, mental health, um, and your ideas of wellness, because we're gonna get back to business. And so I really would argue that this is a good time to become more reflective and more mindful of how we engage in life. Um, same things that our other panelists have said. Can I also just add, sorry, just one quickly, just add this a moment to deepen our, in, our resilience to uncertainty, which I think is important in, in athletic performance, and that we may want to follow Nina Simone's courageous example of feeling good as a radical act right now in this moment. I yeah. just want to throw that out there. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. We have a question, one question from our, our audience. Um, wants to know, can you speak about how you're supporting those athletes who have not had an invitation to combines and relied on opportunity to display skills at campus hosted pro days, but now those opportunities are lost? What are you doing specifically to assist these athletes of winter sports who did not get a year back? That's tough. Well, well go ahead. Oh, no, no, go ahead. Uh, what, what I've done is I've invited them to come and sit down and let's just kind of talk about it. Um, let's really focus on what things we can't control, can't control. So we're going back to resiliency. Um, be tough. So you have to be empathetic, but at the same time, allowing them to fully express themselves and then not, let's come up with a plan. Com athletic competition and being an athlete is just one piece of your life. And so I, fortunately, because I've worked with retired NFL athletes, some of them played back in the 70s and 60s, they can speak to a time where they played football and then they went to work and then they trained and then they got ready for football again. And so I use that just as an analogy of it's a season. Um, and if this has, if this tragedy has impacted your ability to, um, be all that you could be athletically, let's look at how we transfer and translate those into the other areas where you're hoping to be excellent. Um, and so my, 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 my process is uh, allow them to talk about it, empathize and, and understand the importance of that role. But also Akila, you said this, talk about the community that they've established in the framework of being an athlete and where, they, where that's gonna take you 10, 20 years afterwards. Um, and then talk about the, life skills that they've learned as a student athlete and how that's going to help them enhance the rest of their life. Yeah, yeah, I, I, would, I would definitely echo um, what Doc Miller is saying. And so part of it is like, you know, what's going on upstairs, you know, and then, you know, in terms of our kinesiology, what are we doing? Mm. You know, and if I was a cat, you know, if I got skills and I think I should be invited to a combine, then, you know, I'm on my little computer figuring out our movie and putting together my highlight reel myself. Or I'm on LinkedIn putting out that highlight reel on Facebook. You know, people ain't got, coaches ain't got nothing to do right now. They can look at your film. If they're in the NFL, the, uh, whether they're in the Canadian Football League, whatever the case may be, they ain't got nothing but time. So, you know, you can go and, and put some of those things out there, you know, after you've engaged in some of those thoughtful processes that Dr. Miller's talked about. 
Um, with regard to those student athletes who are playing winter sports and didn't get a year back, I'll be writing letters. I'll be writing one to the NCAA right now. I'll be writing one to my college administrator. I'll be writing one to my college coach. And I'll be explaining to them, you know, especially those basketball players. I feel so bad for those basketball players. Mm -hmm. And I ain't going to get into it, Akila. I ain't going to get into no race and gender stuff here because we're talking about mental health. Right. But it's, it's sort of odd, you know, how the kids who bring in a whole lot of money doing March Madness ain't going to get that opportunity. And I'm not going to say why. I don't know. I don't, I don't know why. Mm -hmm. You know, but the reality is, is that if I were one of those kids, I'd be I'd have everybody on my team. And then the kids that I know who are at other power, power, power five conference schools and mid majors, we'd be writing letters. Mm -hmm. That's what we would be doing, because you got to believe that, you know, there were some things that were going on for kids who play those spring sports behind the scenes that allowed them to have an extra year eligibility granted to them. So those things that Dr. Miller said in terms of taking care of this mm -hmm. and then doing some things, you know, within the realm of what you control is what I would recommend. Okay. We had one more question. Um, and uh, I think for, for all of you, as we sort of slowly sort of wrap up this discussion on college sport, um, gender, mental health, and coping um, in the age of, COVID-19 is what are one or two things you would like uh, our guests, our audience, again, to take away from today's conversation? We'll kind of let I, that marinate. As you guys do that, I'm going to mm -hmm. go ahead and share your contact information with our audience should they want to reach out to you for further discussion, questions, or even services. services. What are one or two things that you would phenomenal. like our audience to take away? And it may be to those administrators. Again, it may be directed to parents. Um, it may be uh, directed to those, those athletes. Um, If I, if I had one or two things I would, I would like for people to kind of leave with and resonate, um, let's continue to work together to destigmatize mental health. Um, as a sports psychologist, I can train you to be um, mentally, you know, incredible hulk running through a wall. I've, I'm confident in that. I've worked with athletes in this. How do you drop my time? four tenths of a second so I can be a national champion. And that's, that's it's hard, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's the psychological aspect in addition to things you can't control. So how are you prepared every day to run that race? So for, for the administrator and for the student athlete, um, you have, please utilize those resources and I'm pleading with administrators, provide those resources. Um, we can catch athletes on a good day, but also sports psychology is just a hook. Once I get you in, I can work with you on a number of different areas of depression, anxiety, like I talked about PTSD, relational conflicts. I now have access to go as far as that student athlete wants to go. It could be the good time, the bad time, but I'm present in all of those moments. So please continue to you know, look for professionals who are qualified to serve diverse communities culturally competent professionals to come out and serve your athletic population. That's what I would say. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would, I would say, um, Akila, you know, once we move out of this, this COVID, you know, 19 pandemic, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna face a new world. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be new in a lot of ways. And student athletes, I'd say, you know, once we come out, once we experience this new world, don't you be the same old person. Hmm. You know, you, you really have to do, you really should come out of this new in a couple of ways. Just a couple of ways. Um, could be a game changer for you. And then the second message would be to college coaches and administrators. And that, would, that message would be 
if you don't take this seriously and provide your athletes, in particular your vulnerable athletes, your black male athletes and your white male rural athletes, if you don't provide them with some unique resources and opportunities like Dr. Miller mentioned, it's quite possible that five to 10% of your athletes aren't gonna return for the fall semester. And that's just real talk. They're gonna catch a case. They're gonna have to, they're gonna figure out that, hey, I can make more money, you know, working at Whole Foods than I can get in cost of attendance money. And I can take care of my family in other ways, or they're gonna become parents. So if we don't do some unique things to help those athletes, they're not gonna to return to campus. And, um, those would be the two takeaways for both student athletes and administrators. Okay. I think, yeah, another interesting uh, thing that I've really noticed that a lot of people are coming to terms with is our interdependency, the way that the virus stops because each individual increases their accountability to the collective. Mm -hmm. And so really thinking about that in this moment is actually something uh, we should definitely uh, meditate on and take forward beyond this moment. Um, and the idea, I'd like to just bring it back in, in a moment, may seem tangential to suggest, you know, singing at this moment or music, but I think that there are some powerful effects that we've demonstrated through song and music, um, the brain uh, that you were talking about, um, and uh, that, we, that basically if we do sing together, we raise our voices together, actually those effects are amplified. We actually breathe together, we, our heart rates can even become synchronized. So this is like, this is an interesting thing to think about. If you can be virtually still singing with people, join those singing projects. I certainly invite, invite you to join ours at wallofsongproject.com, but really any kind of singing project or music project where you're participating online can help you to gain these, uh, these choir um, effects, so to speak. And once again, just to conclude by reiterating what I said earlier, just that, um, it's, an, it's a really important time to acknowledge that for many, um, you know, it, there, there was not a lot of feeling good. And so this is how can we think about our own feeling good and our own mental health by lifting up others and their well-being and their mental health at this time and, and, and thinking about our, ourselves as a collective. Mm -hmm. I like it. Thank you, everyone, for, for participating in this talk today. Again, this is just one in a series that we will have. We're gonna have another conversation next week. Um, so stay tuned uh, to that. Uh, go to SJSU, words to action, uh, dot com to find out when the next um, show will be, who, what, and what topic we will discuss. Uh, but I definitely have to give Dr. Gill, uh, Dr. Miller, Ms. Day, <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your voices and in, in, in her words, <laughs> sharing your voice um, to help us cope with um, these challenges, hopefully help us feel a little better, feel, feel a little better today with what um, we all as a community, I mean a global community, are challenged with. But again, I know we have our special gifts and talents and work with these young people and we have an opportunity to engage with them. So I would encourage everyone as my takeaway is to engage with these young people, yes. to connect with these young people. It may be again through virtual means, um, but start a conversation, start some sort of group and begin to utilize some of these tools that we shared today um, to help them create some new structure for them. And as uh, Dr. Gill said, to come out new, you know, to come out different. <laughs> from this situation. So I want to thank everybody um, for, for again, lending their voice. Um, you can, of course, find us at um, the Institute for the Study of Sports, Society, and Social Change. Should you have further questions, please feel free to email us, and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Following this video, we will, we did record it, so it will be available for others to use um, in their own uh, ways. And um, we have some resources available that were presented today that will be downloadable as well. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it so much. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 <laughs> Bye. <laughs>